Hi everybody, I'm Coach Carmen Bott. I'm the author and producer of The Wrestler's Edge. And today on this webinar, I wanna talk about power development specifically for freestyle wrestlers. The Wrestler's Edge is a complete year round off mat training program. And if it's something you're interested in, I'll give you a link at the end of the uh, webinar. But for today, let's dive into some power. So let's start with just a, a great quote. This is from a researcher, um, from those of, for those of you that are interested in the research side, um, from Germany, who I followed for years um, as a sports scientist. And he actually had a, a really good kind of thought process around power development. And he said that, you know, power swims in a sea of strength, meaning that power and strength are not separate entities, but really they have this hierarchical relationship to one another, meaning that strength still serves as a nice foundation for power. And without a decent level of strength as a background, it's really difficult for athletes to be powerful and express that power. But we'll talk a little bit more as we go in terms of, well, how strong does an athlete, and in this case, a wrestler really need to be, to be able to express that strength powerfully. First of all, we need to kind of decide whether or not an exercise is a strength or a power exercise. So exercises or drills can be classified or categorized based on their biomechanical attributes. So when we define strength, we actually kind of have to look at what the person is actually doing and at what velocity they're doing it. Okay, so if they're squatting, for example, that's an example of, a, of an exercise. Now, are they doing that explosively? Are they doing that slowly? What are the attributes of that particular exercise? So this is where I want you guys to sort of start thinking. Now, in power exercises, there are some very key attributes. You might want to write these guys down. The first one is that the velocities are high. Now they're high in comparison to other exercises. It doesn't mean that we're actually, you know, maybe sprinting, which would be a very high velocity, but it would be much obviously higher velocity than um, doing a, a bicep curl that takes you 10 seconds to produce. So in power exercises, we have higher velocities and we have another attribute. And that's the acceleration phase continues to the end of the range of motion. So there's no point in that concentric or positive part of the motion. So in a lot of exercises, it's the up phase where the body is slowing down or the implement they're moving, the athletes moving is slowing down. So this is really an important concept to understand from a physics standpoint. So in power exercises, velocities are high and acceleration continues to the end of the range. Forces do not have to be decelerated. So right away, I want you guys to start thinking about what kind of exercises allow you to accelerate the entire range of motion through the positive phase of the exercise. Another unique attribute of power is that energy is released into the air and it can be released through jumps, hops and throws. And Olympic lifts would actually fall into this category because in terms of just basic analysis, they are actually considered to be jumping exercises. I'll add another component or construct here. If the force is also safely dampened at the end of the movement, so if you catch a clean, you catch the snatch, you hit a heavy bag, or you, you know, kick a ball, Right, you are encountering you know resistance at the end, but it's very safely dampened. That's also considered to be a power exercise. So let's start thinking: what exercises can we safely dampen? Can we accelerate all the way through the range of motion, and can we do fast? That'll give us some clues. So power is also defined as explosive strength. And Verkachansky was one of the original scientists from Russia that said, you know, one should start developing this explosive strength or power quality only after increasing one's maximum strength abilities. I would have to agree with Verkachansky to some extent, and it does depend on really how strong we need an athlete to be 
and really what the power exercise we are they're doing as part of their training. If all I'm asking an athlete to do is jump up and down on the spot, probably an eight year old could do that and they don't necessarily have to be squatting twice their mass. But if I ask an athlete to jump over a hurdle, maybe a whole line of hurdles, like five in a row that is waist height without any loss of body control, perfect absorption, spending very little time on the ground, then they're gonna probably need more maximal strength than that eight year old. So these are just things to consider. I don't have an answer for you. I'm not going to tyell you you have to squat twice your body weight before you can do plyometrics. But I'm going to tell you that if you're not strong or your athlete isn't strong enough, it'll show up during plyometrics. Interestingly enough too, the submaximal loads that bring about the highest power outputs may vary principally upon the nature of the exercises. So what it is we're actually doing. Some exercises we might want to load 85% and do work to improve power. Other exercises we might be good with 30% and improve power. So this idea of having this specific uh, training intensity prescription that's universal across all exercises used for power development is flawed. It depends on the choice of the exercise. And we'll look at that in a moment. So it's a spectrum of load based on some very key exercise and method choices. All right, have I lost anybody? I hope not. Let's move. So squats and deadlifts, you know, everybody's favorite pastime. I don't know. I, I was always an athlete that enjoyed doing my sports a heck of a lot more than I like to squat and deadlift. But You know, athletes do need to do these lifts in order to improve maximal strength. They're very effective. But can we use them to improve power? What do you think? I had a student the other day in my lab say to me, well, if the person can come out of the hole really fast, then it's an excellent choice for power development. I'm going to tell you why it's not. So major strength exercises like squats, bench press, deadlifts, With low resistances, below 50%, what happens is more than half the range of motion or the up phase of that squat or deadlift is spent in deceleration. We know this because we've measured it. Scientists have looked at this. So if you grab a couple of kettlebells and you put them on your chest and you start doing your front squats and you're moving that weight quickly upwards, you're actually not really improving your ability to accelerate and you're probably not improving power. It's okay to try and have intention to move weight fast. There's nothing wrong with that. It does a great job of recruiting type twos, but we want to keep the squats and the deadlifts at the higher end of the one RM, not worry too much about this idea of velocity and build max strength with those lifts. Let me give you some more ammunition here. So the length of the de- deceleration phase is a concern. If you're spending more than half the time slowing down, you're not getting faster. Now, what if you go heavier? Someone says, well, I would never lift less than 50% anyways. Deceleration decreases as resistances do go above 65%. There's no doubt about that. So you will be accelerating longer when you are lifting heavier. Now at 85 to 90%, there's not much of a deceleration phase. But what have we compromised? We've compromised velocity. Velocity, remember, was a property or a principle of power development. So it's fine that we are no longer violating this idea of acceleration, but we're going so slow that we can't really classify a 90% 1RM back squat as a power exercise. We can leave that in the max strength category. So here's your take home. Using light resistances below 50% 1RM in traditional barbell strength exercises to develop power is often counterproductive as it is training the body to decelerate for much of the range of motion rather than continuing to accelerate. And remember, if you go heavy, you're just going to be moving slowly. Did you also know that we can classify different types of power? I mentioned earlier that you can improve power at 30% 1RM. Geez, you can also produce improve power at 
80% 1RM. So when we look at wrestling in particular, wrestling performance may be characterized by varying degrees of speed or external resistance. Knowing this, you can plot the exercises you choose to develop the wrestler, or if you are a wrestler, you can choose different exercises to develop your speed and develop your power. And you can choose a variety of exercises to tra train this full spectrum. Here's some wrestling examples of power expression. So you might have high speed, low external resistance movements. For example, if you're in your stand and you just quickly extend your arm out, that's an example of a high speed, low external resistance movement. It doesn't happen too often in wrestling that we're really worried about the high speed, low external resistance. A soccer player might, because they're kicking a ball. A baseball player might, but wrestlers not so much. With wrestlers, we're really interested in high speed, higher external resistance, meaning you are having to move your entire mass in a particular direction on the mats. If you accelerate your body during your shot, it's considered to be high speed, high external resistance work. Now, low speed, high external resistance work would be your double leg against an opponent. So you're not moving as fast, right? You've engaged your opponent, you're no longer moving at high speeds, but you're now producing a high amount of external resistance and force. So there are exercises we can do in the weight room, not at all to mimic these skills. These skills have to be honed on the mats, but you can do specific types of training in the gym to help you build the qualities that you need as a background for these skills. Never neglect your technical training though, you guys, for the sake of the weight room, the sake of the iron. How many of you have seen the force velocity curve? Maybe some, maybe some of you have, maybe some of you haven't, and that's okay. It's actually a lot more simple than this graph makes it look to be. It's a basic rule. If I'm producing more force, I'm not going to be moving very fast. So if I push a weighted sled that weighs 200 pounds or I push a car, I'm not going to be able to sprint and do that. So up on the top left-hand side of this graph, we've got maximal strength. And so exercises that fit into those buckets are our squats and our deadlifts, over 80% 1RM, our bench press, our military press, absolutely essential lifts for improving that hierarchical quality of max strength. Now, if you want power, this is where Olympic lifting and plyometrics come in. Now, there are some people that suggest, you know, Olympic lifting isn't necessary for power development. And I would agree there are other exercises you can do to improve power, and we'll look at those. As long as you don't violate the law, you must be able to accelerate that load fully. If you can't, you are not improving your power because you are spending time decelerating. There's also speed strength, which is a power quality, or we could call this elastic strength, and that's honed through plyometrics. I love plyometrics. I think they're one of the best types of training methods one can do to improve higher velocity, lower force power quality. That was you being able to accelerate your mass toward your opponent before you've engaged them. The Olympic lift would represent more of that lower velocity, high external resistance. So you've engaged your opponent and now you're trying to manipulate their mass. You're trying to take them down. So let's look at the methods of power development to finish off today's webinar. The first method is called accelerate the weight. I know that's not much of a name, but I couldn't think of anything better. So you can either use this method and catch at the end. So think about the exercises where you're catching the weight. A clean, right? A snatch. Or you can release the weight. Or you can literally leave the ground. Well, it's important to differentiate drills and exercises because we need to make sure that we are developing power if this is the goal. And again, the difference lies in your ability to accelerate through the full range of movement. So that's why this method is called the acceleration method. And at the bottom, we have your training examples. So we have Olympic lifts. And if you're not proficient in those lift, lifts, we have weighted jumps. How many of you have ever held dumbbells in your hands and jumped? Great drill. How many of you have held the trap bar and jumped? Another fantastic drill. 
And there are obviously modifications of the Olympic lift. You don't have to necessarily pull from the floor. You can do it from the hang position. You can pull from blocks. You can do snatches or you can do cleans. You see, the thing is, folks, is wrestlers are not weightlifters. They're wrestlers, but we can use these lifts to, to improve our ability to accelerate. Another training example is to throw a kettlebell or a medicine ball. That's B. If I release the weight, then I'm also accelerating the weight, aren't I? And building that explosive power. There are many different recipes out there that you can follow. Today's webinar is more about the principles of power development. So you know what exercises to pick. Once you know the exercises, then we can get into the sets and reps. The second method you might be familiar with is called accommodating resistance. And this is where we would might, might put bands on a bar or chains. What it does is it alters the force profile of the lift. If we add the bands or the chains, it will extend the acceleration phase. Remember I said that at the top part of the motion that we're actually starting to slow down well, the theory behind bands is that we're actually continuing to accelerate against that resistance further into the range of motion. So that's the purpose of it. That's the science behind using bands. I'll give you an example. As the chain or the band, the, well, the chain would unfurl and the band would get tighter. The mass increases, thus altering the kinetic profile of the lift. It becomes more like a power exercise. And it also dampens the aggressiveness of the lockout. If you've ever done a, a high velocity or attempted a high velocity squat without bands, you'll hear the, the uh, plates at the top of the movement go ka-ching like that. Well, that's actually representing the fact that you've just had to decelerate that motion. And we have reflexes to prevent us from damaging our joints. But those reflexes also create deceleration. And if we put the bands on, it kind of deadens those reflexes a little bit and allows us to um, handle that load. However, you can, cannot put bands on Olympic lifts. You can only put them on bench, squat, deadlift. So you're sort of your power lifting exercises. For myself personally, I prefer to use those exercises to build maximum strength. And I do prefer the Olympic lifts to build explosive power. That's another dog. We can, you can apply this to any free weight barbell or multi-joint, barbell multi-joint exercise. All right, next method. How many of you have heard of complexes? Complexes is where we mix a heavy resistance strength exercise. We might take that deadlift or squat and then we pair it with a lighter resistance power exercise. So the principles of power are accelerate through the full range of motion and have do something at a higher velocity, right? So it makes sense that we might want to squat, rest, and then do a jump squat or do a series of jump squats. There are many, many effective protocols for complexes. The example I've given you here is one of maybe 50, you guys. Okay, the main thing to pay attention to when you read about complex training is the rest periods. So some don't have any indication of rest period, which is problematic. You definitely still want to do a rest after your heavy strength exercise and then you do your jump or your throw and then after that you would also rest and then go back to your heavy resistance strength exercise again and you would do that in multiple sets like you would do it on any resistance program complexes are highly effective and the wrestler's edge i actually put them in in, a, in particular phases to help build that explosive power the next method or method four are plyometrics. I mentioned how much I love plyometrics for building elastic strength in tissues, and it really helps improve that shot speed with wrestlers. It's there to develop power, but it builds something else, and that's called reactive strength ability. It allows athletes to develop maximal force in minimal time. And how does it do this? It actually stimulates the muscles by a sudden stretch. And that sudden stretch precedes the voluntary effort. So it's sort of like thinking about the landing and then the redirection of your energy. Okay. Or if you're in your wrestling stance, it's that quick change in elevation 
it could be so subtle. It could be 10 degrees. Quick load, and then you explode. Okay, it could even be your counterattack on the mats. And we can train this using this method. We use kinetic energy versus heavy weights when we do plyometrics. And essentially, this method is characterized by impulsive action of minimal duration between the end of the eccentric or breaking phase and then the initiation of the acceleration phase. So we want, in plyometrics, we want your ground contact times to be extremely fast, extremely quick. We want the responsiveness of your muscles, that load, that quick level change to be extremely controlled but very fast and then that redirection of energy and force to be very very fast for something to be truly plyometric so super training which is a great book suggested that the contact phase in true plyometrics is less than 0.15 seconds the interesting thing about that is they neglected to probably say that many athletes are not trained enough to be able to do that so how do we train them to be able to do that is we use this method and we get better at plyometrics. Plyometrics are skill-based movements that need coaching. So it's not something where you can give an athlete, here's your plyometric program. It's something that needs to be coached. All right, let's finish up here, you guys. So I mentioned that we've got this idea of a force velocity curve, right? On the bottom, which is our X axis, we've got meters per second, which is the speed at which either you as a human or a bar, barbell is moving, load is moving. And then we've got force here on the Y axis from low force to high force. And you can see if I do high force work, it's going to be low velocity. So no matter how you skin it, you guys, squatting and deadlifting does not improve speed. But it swims, but speed swims in a sea of max strength. So meaning that when you improve your max strength through heavy squats, pulls, presses, and deadlifts, it will later on down the line affect the speed of which you can move to a point. Strength speed is the next quality, and we can improve that by doing Olympic lifts and jerks. Well, jerks are part of Olympic lifts. For power development or peak power, which you saw on my force velocity curve earlier, we have medicine ball throws and jumps with big amplitude, which is big ranges of motion. And then we have elastic speed strength, which are more plyometric in nature the way I defined it ground contact times being very, very quick. So that really quick response of uh, hopping, okay? Or quick jumps off the hands if you're doing a, like an upper body plyometric. But the ranges of motions in the joints are really small. So you're not bending the knees and the hips very much. But I'm not saying don't do squat jumps. Squat jumps are awesome. They just fit up a little higher because they're a little slower. Okay, so they would be with the big amplitude uh, jumps. And then finally, speed, which we didn't really hone in on today. Um, one of the best ways to develop speed is, is through sprinting, okay? Or do, doing live drills, wrestling drills that are specific to the technical skills uh, needed in the sport. And I would encourage wrestlers to do some sprinting, um, but also spend a ton of time on the mats uh, drilling at, at high velocities with, with no load, right? It's just your body that you're moving. Now, what if I train? Well, if I train with heavy squats and deadlifts, something will happen. And this is this force velocity curve in terms of how it adapts. It should move, okay, in this direction, which is a whole um, movement to the right. However, if I spend too much time, and that's total training time, doing heavy squats and deadlifts, that curve isn't going to shift. You can see it here. The red line is representing a chronic response to low velocity heavy lifting. So hopefully that gave you guys some insight on how to develop power and what methods you'll use, you can use, and what exercises and drills are best for improving power in the wrestler. If you're interested in the wrestler's edge, um, go to fightcampconditioning.com. 
Uh, I'm Coach Carmen Bott. I've been fortunate enough to work with three world um, uh, world level wrestlers, all um, meddling at the 2018 World Championships. I work with members of the USA uh, national squad, and uh, I love the sport. I'm always studying new and improved methods to develop these athletes. Um, spent a lot of time reading uh, Russian literature to um, having it translated so I understand um, the physical development side of things a little bit better. But never neglect your mat time for time in the gym. Um, I've always been an athlete, and I'm a big um, proponent of getting very, very good at your craft searching for mastery, but of course, never getting there, just continuing on with the journey of excellence. Thank you very much for your time today, folks. I'll pop back up on the screen, give you a wave. Peace out. Have a great day. Cheers.